Before we talk about the next thing, which should be a review for you, transcription and translation, let's try to understand the big picture. And uh, let's look on the previous page, B16. B16, and this shows a set. Uh, it doesn't matter that it's kind of oblong. It could have, uh, it, they could have drawn it a nice and round. They could have drawn it cuboidal or columnar shaped. Cells come in different shapes and sizes. Here's the cell. Here's the nucleus of the cell. It's a eukaryotic cell. You've had micro, you talked about prokaryotic bacteria. We're talking about human cells. <clears throat> and so uh, here's the nucleus. Inside the nucleus are 46 chromosomes made out of DNA, 23 pairs. They contain the information, the genetic information, to how to build proteins. We've already just now reviewed that the DNA, those chromosomes, have to be replicated before one cell can divide into a, a, a two cells. So we've already talked about DNA replication why it has to happen, and when it happens. Now, <clears throat> here's the fundamental problem. You'll remember from biology and from anatomy that there is a tubular network in the cytoplasm called the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum. Remember the ER? There's actually two types of ER. Remember this? Smooth ER and rough ER, or granular ER. And uh, the, we've, uh, the smooth ER has its role in lipid metabolism, but the ribosomes of the granular ER, or rough ER, is where proteins are made. So proteins are built out of amino acids at the ribosomes of the rough or granular ER. So this is the, here's the problem. You'd say, tell me about it, what's the problem? Uh, this is where you're going to build the protein, at the ribosome the granular or rough ER. But where are the instructions for how to build the protein? Here in the nucleus. That's what the DNA is. Each gene in the D on the chromosomes is an instruction for how to build a protein. So here's the problem. How do we get the instruction for how to build a protein out to the construction site where the protein is going to be built? You see the problem? What's the answer to that? Hmm? RNA. That's the answer. That's what RNA is for. Now, I want to emphasize something. Each chromosome made out of DNA contains about 2,000 genes. That's instructions for 2,000 different proteins. Remember, we were looking at that chart, and we saw, like, autosome 11 had a gene for making hemoglobin, and a gene for making insulin, and a gene for making melanin. So each chromosome has instructions for maybe 2,000, how to make 2,000 different proteins. If this were, let's say, let's say this was a pancreas cell. And let's say this is the pancreas cell that makes insulin. Now, it's got instructions on autosome 11 for making insulin, for making hemoglobin, for making melanin, for making a whole bunch of proteins. We just want to make insulin here. So what happens in the nucleus is we're just going to make a copy of the, gene, the insulin gene. And we're going to take that copy of the insulin gene and send it out to the ribosomes. That copy of one gene is called a messenger RNA. That's what an mRNA, or messenger RNA, is. It is a copy of a single gene. We don't need to copy the entire chromosome containing 2,000 different gene genetic instructions. We, this cell just needs to make insulin. It doesn't need to, this pancreas cell doesn't make hemoglobin. Obviously, we're also saying, though, that every cell does have a complete set of instructions. But cells specialize to make only certain things, certain chemicals. So that's the idea of, of uh, what an RNA is. The messenger RNA, or mRNA, uh, is a copy of a single gene. 
If this were a B lymphocyte, a lymphocyte, a certain white blood cell that makes antibodies, then it would just we, it need to make a copy of the gene for making antibody proteins. If this is a, uh, if this is a, uh, a skin cell and it needs to make melanin, then it just needs to make a copy of the gene, the instruction for making melanin. It doesn't need to make get copies of all the instructions. All right, so uh, the process of making a copy of a gene is called transcription. That's a great name because the, literally what the word transcription means is to make a copy. Because the, literally the word uh, transcript or transcribe or transcription means to make a copy. That's literally what it means. You can look it up. It's in the English dictionary. So we're making a copy of a gene. This copy of the gene is called an mRNA, a messenger RNA. So once we have, the, it's like having, here's an analogy. If you had a book, but you just want to photocopy one page of this big book. All right, so we're just going to photocopy one page, and then we're going to take that page uh, somewhere else. All right, so we've got this book of genetic instructions. We're only going to photocopy or make a copy of that one page, that one gene, and that photocopy is called an RNA, and we're going to send it through this tubular network called the endoplasmic reticulum. It's going to attach to a ribosome, and there that, that uh, photocopy of that gene is going to be used as the instructions for how to build a protein. So uh, here's what we uh, had written under transcription on page uh, B17. So uh, we said it, uh, the word transcription means to make a copy of a gene. And uh, so this has to occur before a cell can manufacture or synthesize proteins. Now how does this work? We wrote that that portion of the DNA that specifies a protein, right? So that chromosome or DNA that specifies the particular protein we want, it's going to unzip. And one of the strands is going to act as a pattern to construct a complementary RNA strand for its path. Uh, we can see that back on the previous page, B16 at the bottom. So on the bottom of B16, here's what we see. This is the DNA, right? This is the double helix. This is the whole long, as it were, chromosome. And it, it, these, these are the gene segments. Here's a gene segment. Here's another gene segment. 2,000 gene segments. 2,000 genetic instructions. There's an instruction for hemoglobin here, the instruction for insulin here, the instruction for something else here, the instruction for melanin over here. So we only want to make a copy of just this segment that contains the instructions for making insulin, or whichever protein that particular cell is trying to make. So it unzips, very much like helicase again, just unzipping it, but just in this one area. And then a messenger RNA forms. Now, I'm not going to get into all the details of exactly how this, uh, it, uh, 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 the details of how this forms. Technically, it's being tra uh, transcribed from the five prime to the three prime end. I'm not going to get into that. But you'll notice this is obviously DNA. You'd say, how do you know? Because it's got A's and G's and C's and T's. That's characteristic of DNA. Now, this is the complementary strand. So uh, it doesn't show it. Maybe in the future I'll write it out. But obviously the complement of this T would be an A over here, but it's just unzipped. All right. But now this strand is basically acting as a, a pattern to create a complementary strand. But it's only one strand, not two, as in DNA. And you'll notice it's got A's and G's and C's and U's. So we know it's an RNA. We also know it's an RNA because it's just one chain and not two complementary chains. So uh, the, it, in order to make this uh, copy uh, of uh, this DNA gene, we also need an enzyme called RNA polymerase. Remember, to make a copy of DNA, we needed an enzyme called DNA polymerase. So uh, enzymes are what make chemical reactions occur. There are thousands of different enzymes. Without them, nothing would happen. So uh, the way this is uh, copied, uh, opposite uh, a C, what nor normally C complementarily uh, attaches to a G. And that's true whether we're talking about uh, DNA or RNA. 
uh, opposite uh, uh, a, a T is an A, right? Uh, but you'll notice that where we have an A, if we were making DNA, the complement of, of uh, an A uh, in a DNA molecule would be a T, but RNA doesn't use Ts. It uses U's instead of Ts, uracil instead of thymine. So opposite the A is a U. So that's how it complementarily uh, uh, forms. And uh, once we've made this copy of this segment, this is really, in a sense, a photocopy. Really, what this is, is absolutely identical to this side, except it uses U's instead of T's. Does that make sense? It is absolutely identical to what would be here on the DNA, except it's using U's instead of T's. Yep? Why they use U? Because God made it that way. <laughs> That's just the way it is. You know, we could ask, uh, ultimately, you could ask, why is anything this way? You know, uh, why are there uh, males and females? You know, why is the, uh, what is the world, you know, what, whatever question you have. Science really can't answer why. It tries to explain what and when and how, how it works, why it works, why it's that way, because that's the way it is. All right? You know, why does our body look the way it is? You know, could it look differently? I don't know. Yeah, but this is the way it is. So uh, why is really not a question. We, we do use, the closest we get to answering a why is how. How does it work? Okay, but why is the way it is. Right? So uh, that's uh, some things that become philosophy or religion. But uh, this how is a good question. How? how why, why ever it ever is that way, how does it work, though? That's what we want to know. All right, so uh, let's uh, summarize what we wrote about transcription here. So uh, we've just shown you how uh, that part, that part, part of the DNA that uh, specifies a protein unzips down the middle so that one of the strands acts as a pattern. Commonly, books call that a template to construct a complementary RNA strand for its half. So in order to basically do this, to make this, you need the uh, DNA, obviously, that's going to unzip. You need that enzyme RNA polymerase. You need a bunch of RNA nucleotides, A's and G's and C's and U's. Uh, and you need some ATP to provide the energy to power this thing to join together. All right, and then each of these uh, messenger RNAs acts like a cytoplasmic messenger. You'd say, what? Why do they call it that? Because it's going to go out of the nucleus, travel through that endoplasmic reticulum tube uh, out in the cytoplasm, and attach to a ribosome construction site. So now uh, that that uh, messenger RNA has attached to the ribosome, now we can talk about how that, it, genet that uh, copy of the gene for making insulin is going to be translated into building a protein. Now, before I start to read this, let's just show you a picture. So if we look on the next page, B18, Now again, uh, with all these subjects, they do get much more complicated than what I'm presenting. And if you had a good solid biology course, uh, maybe micro, you uh, are very likely covered this in much greater detail than I'm going to present it in. All right, what are we looking at? This is an enlarged view of the ribosome. Remember those little granules? Uh, uh, of uh, granular rough ER. Technically, the ribosome is made up of two parts. There's a larger part here and a smaller part here. Uh, and they're actually made of, the ribosome is actually made up of a type of RNA, known as ribosomal RNA. Uh, I don't care that much that you know that, but it is made out of something. It's made out of ribosomal RNA and some proteins. It kind of acts like a clamshell. Uh, you'll see, if you watch the animated videos that I've linked, you'll see that that's what it shows how it works. We're not really going to get into that. This is the messenger RNA that has been attached, that, uh, that is now attached to this ribosome. This is the messenger RNA. Uh, and that's the most important part of this uh, whole picture here. Now, uh, uh, as we look at this uh, uh, messenger RNA, Every three nucleotides, every three nucleotides is known as a triplet or codon. 
Now, if it was up to me, I'd call it a triplet. Makes sense. Triplet means three. Although, usually, the people do refer to it as a codon. So you should know that it's called a codon. All right, so who cares? What, who cares about every three nucleotides is called a triplet or a codon? Every triplet, every codon, is a coded message for, a, a pro, uh, for, I'm sorry, for an amino acid. So every triplet or codon is a coded message for a particular amino acid. So uh, I remember when uh, they finally cracked the genetic code and figured how this worked. Uh, in the late 1950s is when Watson and Crick discovered uh, the structure of DNA. And throughout the entire 60s, which is way before any of you can remember, but I can, throughout the entire 60s, they were trying to figure out how this DNA molecule, they knew that it was made out of DNA nucleotides. They didn't understand how it somehow controlled everything going on in a cell. It had the information of how to build you, because that DNA was somehow a coded message of uh, your blood type and your eye color and what you would grow into and everything. And they weren't sure exactly how that worked. In the early 70s, they cracked the genetic code and how this all works. And that's shown really right down here in the lower half. What this shows is that uh, for each triplet or codon, it indicates what amino acid it codes for. And you'll notice that uh, for most of them, uh, there's more than one uh, triplet or codon that will code for the same amino acid. So there's a redundancy built in. I'm not going to get into that. Uh, so you'll notice that any of, uh, well, like any of these four will code for the amino acid threonine. Uh, sometimes there's just two that will code for a particular amino acid. Very interestingly, AUG is the only codon or triplet that codes for the amino acid methionine. You'll remember that most amino acids, not all, but most, have that ending E, right? Uh, asparagine, lysine, threonine, serine, proline. There are some exceptions like tryptophan, which is right here. Uh, so, uh, in fact, tryptophan, you'll notice, is just coded by one codon. No, there's no redundancy. And another one that uh, has just one codon or triplet that codes for it is the amino acid methionine. But uh, AUG has another interesting role. AUG not only either codes for the amino acid methionine, it also specifies start. And you'd say, what do you mean start? So if you look at the beginning of any messenger RNA, at the beginning of every messenger RNA, it will always have AUG. And basically, that means start translating this. Begin translating here. It's almost like writing a computer software code, right? So this, in this case, when it appears at the beginning, it's not a coded message for the amino acid methionine, but it simply indicates start translating. All right, now if AUG appears anywhere else, then it codes for the amino acid methionine. Is there so, another one for ending? Yes, there is. Uh, the, uh, you'll notice that it says right here, UGA appears at the end and it's stop. Oh. So literally, you've got almost a punctuation mark, begin here, stop here. Yeah. This is cool, it's like a machine. Yeah, it's it's like a software program. Because when you uh, write software, you actually have to write a software that says begin here and stop here uh, in software. So, uh, and this is all part of what's commonly known in a broader context as information theory. And information theory, whether we're dealing with uh, so, uh, computer information or in, uh, 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 brain information or genetic information, it works very, very similarly. So. Uh, at advanced levels where they get into information theory. This is all part of uh, all this stuff. Anyhow, uh, looking at this uh, messenger RNA, let's just take a look uh, for a moment right here where I kind of shaded it in, and it says, uh, there's a codon that says UUU. So what does UUU specify? So why don't you look down below and see what UUU specifies. Can you see it? All right, so UUU is a coded message for the amino acid phenylalanine. It's a coded message for the amino acid phenylalanine. So what that means is that as we're building uh, a uh, protein, remember proteins are made up of a chain of amino acids. So here we can already see part of the chain of amino acids linked together, a polypeptide chain. 
And what's supposed to come right here is phenylalanine, and look at that. Can everybody see? U, 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 and there's phenylalanine. Now, let's look at the next one. The very next codon is GGU. I've already told you what it specifies. I said glycine. Let's just check. Look down below and see where GGU is. And you'll notice I've circled it. GGU is glycine. So in this coded message, that's what this gene is. That's what this genetic code is. Every codon is a coded message of which amino acid to put next to build this polypeptide chain or protein. So this is literally, we're translating this genetic code into the construction of a polypeptide chain or protein. So what's supposed to come next is glycine. And here it comes. You'd say where? Right here. Here's the glycine. Now the question is, what's this? This is like a truck that brings the amino acid to the construction site. We call these trucks transfer RNAs or tRNAs. So you're thinking, if, you're, if you haven't been familiar with this uh, already, you're thinking, wait a second. So you said there's a messenger RNA? Yeah, that's this. You said the ribosome is made up of ribosomal RNA? Yes, I did. And there's a third type called T, or transfer RNA. And just like T uh, is for transfer, it could also be like a truck. Now, how many, how many types of amino acids are there? How many types of amino acids are there? 20. 20. We talked about that in section A. So we need a different truck or transfer RNA for each type of amino acid. Each truck or transfer RNA will only transport one of the 20. So there are 20 different types of transfer RNAs, 20 different types of trucks, as it were. This truck always carries glycine. Now how does this truck know to drop off the glycine right here? Well. <clears throat> Uh, it has a license plate. Now, this, uh, the books don't call it a license plate. They would call this the anti-codon. So uh, this transfer RNA is actually made up of a coiled up RNA molecule, and it's made up of nucleotides, and there's a triplet right here at the end. I call it a license plate, but it's technically called an anti-codon. It reads CCA. Now, what does our codon say? GGU. What's the complement of G? C. C. What's the complement of another G? C. What's the complement of U? A. A. Notice the license plate is, or anticodon is the exact complement of this. So this parks right here and it drops off its glycine. Then what's going to happen after it drops off its glycine, right? And that glycine is going to attach to the phenylalanine, and that's called a peptide bond. So then this truck is going to pull out, and here you can see this truck, which had originally dropped off leucine, is pulling out, and it's going to go into the cytoplasm and pick up another load of, well, in this case, it's going to pick up another load of leucine. This kind of truck is going to pick up another load of glycine, and they pick it up in the cytoplasm, and then they come back to this construction site, and in the case of glycine, it's going to look for the very next place where there's a GGU to park opposite. Because it's only going to park and drop off its load of glycine where the uh, license plate or anticodon is the complement of the, that codon. You'll notice that the license plate on this truck is not this license plate or anticodon was CCA. This one was GCG. That was the complement of this over here of CGC. All right, so they have different quote license plates. These trucks, twenty different trucks, twenty different types of transfer RNAs. Each one transports one of the different twenty amino acids. So uh, let's just see, take this the next step. The right after this codon that's uh, GGU that specified glycine, the next codon is ACA. What does ACA specify? Let's look at our chart down below. ACA. All right, so I've, I've circled it to help you find it quickly. ACA is one of the codes for the threonine, the amino acid threonine. So that means that the next amino acid after a glycine, after glycine has to be threonine. 
And look, I can see it. You'd say, where? Right here at the top of the page. Here's the truck bringing threonine. All right, and it's bringing it right to the construction site. Notice its license plate, or what is properly called the anticodon. It's UGU. And it's going to park right here. Why? What's the complement of an A? U. Complement of a, a C? G. Complement of another A? U. So UGU, that's what's on the license plate here. That's the anticodon. So it can't park anywhere else. It can only park where the uh, anticodon is the complement of the codon. So it's going to drop off that load of threonine. Now, as, as each of these trucks lines up and do drops off its amino acid, based upon this coded message, we are building a protein. So a protein is made up of a precise sequence of amino acids that have been linked together. Now, once this entire polypeptide chain has been formed, and we reach the end of the messenger RNA, then this whole polypeptide chain disconnects and it coils into a slinky. Well, in other words, a protein. All right? So first it forms, it's a long polypeptide chain, and then it coils up into a three-dimensional structure, and now we've got a protein. So that's it. Yep? Okay, now when you make, when, if this was a pancreas cell and it's needing to make, let's say, insulin, do you think you're gonna, it's going to make more than just one single molecule of insulin? Actually, it does. Because you're going to need, you know, when you secrete insulin, you don't just secrete one single molecule. So it's going to make millions of molecules, millions of molecules. After it's made millions and then it stores them, uh, anybody know where chemicals are commonly stored before they're secreted? The sacs of the Golgi complex. Does that remember, remember, ring a bell? Remember the Golgi complex or Golgi body or Golgi apparatus? After it's made sufficient amounts of insulin to last for a little bit of time, then, as we're going to see very shortly, the RNA can then be broken down. We don't need it anymore. We, we used it, it's like uh, if you had a blueprint of how to build a building, all right, well, once you build the building, uh, you don't really need that blueprint. All right? So well, don't you need to keep a cop? We've got the original blueprint in the nucleus. We don't need to keep this. This was out in the construction site. We built what we needed. We can throw it away in the basket. If we ever need to make more, and that pancreas cell will need to make more, then it will transcribe or make a copy of that gene for insulin again, and we'll do this whole thing all over again. So this is going to go on all the time. But uh, the cell doesn't, you know, it's only going to make so much, and then it's going to stop. And then it'll break down the RNA because it's done its job. <clears throat> now, uh, remember something else that uh, each cell is specialized to make certain proteins. Uh, red blood cells make hemoglobin protein. Uh, certain white blood cells make antibody proteins. Skin cells make melanin protein. Uh, pancreas cells, certain pancreas cells make uh, insulin uh, protein. Other pancreas cells make glucagon protein. So cells are specialized to make different proteins. Even though in the nucleus, they have the instructions for making every kind of protein that the, every cell in your body is capable of making, the cells become differentiated or specialized just to make certain uh, proteins. Uh, the only cells that can actually make any kind of protein are called embryonic stem cells. And if it's not an embryonic stem cell, if it's a pancreas cell, it's already specialized to just make, let's say, insulin. Uh, and if it's a skin cell, it's already specialized or differentiated to make uh, proteins like melanin. Uh, so that, that's the difference between an embryonic stem cell, an early embryonic cell that can grow into anything. It could become a liver cell, a pancreas cell, a skin cell, a white blood cell, and it could produce all these, whatever, all these different proteins. But once a cell has already committed or specialized into a particular type, uh, most of the genes are turned off. And it can only uh, make copies of certain of those genes uh, in the nucleus. All right, that's all dyed in with the operon theories and stuff like that. Um, OK, so let's summarize what I've just been talking about back on the previous page, B17. On B17.
So in B17, uh, translation of the genetic code. That's what they're talking about. Uh, it, the nucleotide sequence on the, me uh, the messenger RNA, which <laughs> corresponds to the nucleotide sequence of the DNA, that's simply, right, it was formed off the DNA. What all these DNA, uh, the DNA and RNA sequences specifies the sequence of amino acids in a protein. That's why I had mentioned to you that if our definition of a, uh, a, a protein was a precise sequence of amino acids, and we said that the definition of a nucleic acid was a precise sequence of nucleotides, that wasn't coincidence. It is the precise sequence of nucleotides that determines, that specifies what that precise sequence of amino acids are that make up the protein. Again, what am I saying? The DNA sequence determines the RNA sequence, which determines the amino acid sequence of the proteins. That's what, that's, all this is information. And it also means, again, if there were a, a defect in the nucleotide sequence of the DNA, there will be a defect in the nucleotide sequence of the RNA, which will result in a defect in the amino acid sequence of the proteins. And then you produce a defective protein. All right, uh, the transfer RNAs, the trucks, right, act like trucks to transport the different types of amino acids to the ribosome construction site. The amino acids are joined together by what we call peptide bonds, forming a polypeptide chain. And then the polypeptide chain coils up uh, into our uh, protein structure. All right, so that's pretty much uh, laid out uh, how it works. A um, couple of other things here on page B19. On B19, we've said that there's actually three types of RNA. The most important of the three uh, is messenger RNA. It is a copy of the gene for making a protein. There's also the rRNA, the ribosomal RNA. What is that? That makes up the ribosome. And then there's those trucks, the transfer RNAs, that transport uh, the uh, amino acids to the construction site. And then, uh, again, another diagram showing exactly what we were pointing out. It is the, here's the DNA. The, uh, the nucleotide sequence on one of the strands of the DNA will act as the pattern to create a messenger RNA. So here's the DNA coding strand. Here it's forming a messenger RNA that's the complement. What do we call this process of, of, uh, of uh, making a copy of this gene? That's called transcription, right? This is a gene. So we're making a copy, that's called transcribing, making a copy of a gene. And then this messenger RNA uh, uh, acts as a coded message. Each codon specifies a specific amino acid. So it is this uh, sequence of codons on the messenger RNA that determines the amino acid sequence of a protein. What do we call this process of translating uh, these codons into the construction of a protein, translation, which is a good word, because you're just translating. So we've gone from DNA to messenger RNA to protein. So that's the sequence. Okay, so on B21, uh, it says at the top, uh, catabolism of old proteins. Now, we've just been learning about how we manufacture new proteins. Right? That's what we're dealing with. Uh, how we translate and synthesize more new insulin and how we could synthesize other proteins. The question is this, why do we need to manufacture new proteins? Aren't we all, we're, our, we're an adult size. We, we're mostly made out of, after water, what are we mostly made out of? Proteins. Why do we still need to make new proteins? And the answer is because the old proteins are always being broken down. And because the old proteins are always being broken down, we have to manufacture new proteins to take their place. So catabolism, like ca catastrophic, means to break apart. Old proteins, now we've already learned, proteins, how are they broken down? We know they are first broken apart into amino acids, 
And then the am amino group is deaminated, removed from the amino acid, uh, forming ammonia, and the ammonia is converted into urea and excreted out of our body. And what's left of the deaminated amino acid is called a keto acid that can be used for energy, as a source of energy. But we're always breaking down old proteins, and that's why we always need to manufacture new proteins to take their place. Now, uh, synthesis of nucleic acids. So we talked about this uh, uh, already as well. We know that we replicate or make new DNA. When does a cell need to make or, uh, a new DNA to uh, carry on DNA synthesis, to uh, make a copy of a chromosome? It has to do that before one cell can divide into two cells. Again, technically that occurs during the S period of interphase in the life cycle of the cell. Uh, also, not only do we make new DNA, we make RNA. You say, what do you mean? Well, what do you mean we make RNA? We transcribe uh, uh, our DNA into RNA. We produce messenger RNA and trucks called transfer RNA and ribosomal RNA in order so that we can synthesize proteins. So we have to make RNA, such as messenger RNA, before a cell can synthesize a protein. Before the cell can make insulin, it's got to make a copy of that gene in the form of a messenger RNA. So our cells are always uh, making uh, our nucleic acids, new DNA before one cell can divide into two, and new RNA so that it can manufacture proteins. But uh, we're also, uh, let's look at here, and we'll come back to what's there next, what's in our food. We're also breaking down old nucleic acids. You'd say, what do you mean? Not only do we break down old proteins, we break down old nucleic acids. Uh, and uh, how, are, what are, how do we break down or catabolize uh, nucleic acids? So nucleic acids like DNA and RNA are made up of nucleotides. So these nucleic acids, the old ones, are broken apart into nucleotides. And the nucleotides are converted into a waste product called uric acid. And uric acid is also uh, carried in our bloodstream and then filtered out of our bloodstream and excreted in our urine. So there are really the two major organic waste products that we produce are, what are they? Urea and uric acid. Urea is formed from the breakdown of old proteins. Uric acid is formed from the breakdown of nucleic acids. So on page B20, here's what it shows. Amino acids, we've already covered how the amino group can be removed, right? That's called deamination. It forms ammonia, and the ammonia is turned into urea and excreted in our urine. And uh, this process of forming uh, uh, ammonia and urea primarily occurs in our liver. Now. Nucleic acids, like DNA and RNA, they're broken apart into nucleotides. And then the nucleotides are turned into uric acid. We actually had, in section A, when we were looking at the structures of, such, uh, as, of adenine and guanine, we had a picture of uric acid. And I mentioned that it was a waste product formed from breaking apart uh, nucleotides. So this is the, uh, these are the two major waste products that uh, we form. Let's also look at the yellow inside uh, front cover that we did last class meeting, if I could find mine. Uh, yeah. uh, so on the inside front cover, the yellow inside one, so let's take a look at the bottom lab form. And on the uh, bottom lab form, you remember this was from Kaiser Hospital, and uh, here it's labeled blood chemistry. And these first three chemicals that are listed on the form are the three major waste products. They are the three major waste products that we produce in our body and excrete in our urine. And two of the three we've now learned about. The major organic waste is urea, or urea nitrogen or blood urea nitrogen. Uh, that is formed from the breakdown of proteins. Creatinine, I have not talked about, but creatinine is a waste product formed in our muscle tissue. Uh, uric acid is the one that we're mentioning right now. 
Uric acid is formed from the breakdown of old nucleic acids. Those are the big three. And incidentally, you'll notice that the normal amounts of creatinine and uric acid are slightly different for males and females. There are differences between men and women. So what's considered normal for men is a little bit higher levels than those for women. Uh, one specific good example of that that's easy to point out, as I mentioned, creatinine is a waste product formed in our muscle tissue. Since the average guy has more muscle mass than the average female, that would explain why the average guy has more creatinine than the average female. So, because they have more muscle mass. All right, so uh, just thought I'd point that out. Now, uh, going back on page B21, so on B21, uh, just to answer a couple of things real quickly here. Um, first of all, I asked the question, what's in our food? And the point that I'm trying to make, it's in, wait a minute, what's in our food? is I mentioned that we manufacture new nucleic acids. We make new DNA uh, before one cell can divide into new, another. We make RNA. We said DNA and RNA are made from nucleotides. Where do we get these nucleotides from? Well, like everything else, they're in our food. So you'd say, we got nucleotides in our food? Well, we, we're everything, we've talked about this before. Everything we eat, with the exception of water and salt, came from a living thing. All living things are made up of cells. Cells, all cells contain DNA and RNA. So when you eat food, when you're eating meat, when you're eating fish, eggs, plants, they, uh, uh, you're literally eating ground up parts of cells or whole cells and so on, and they contain nucleic acids. We digest these nucleic acids into nucleotides and absorb those nucleotides into our bloodstream. And then those nucleotides become available for us to assemble them into D human DNA and human RNA. All right, so just remind you of that. Now, another thing that uh, we wrote here is a question. What is gout? So if you had me for anatomy, you should know this answer already. The, a gout is a type of arthritis. There are three major types of arthritis. And uh, they are, as I wrote, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and gouty arthritis. So uh, what's the difference between these three types of arthritis? Inflammation of the joints. Osteoarthritis is primarily due to repeated trauma. You'd say, so what's trauma? Trauma is injury. When somebody repeatedly injures their ankle, repeatedly injures their knee, repeatedly injures their elbow, so these joints, these parts of our body, start to become chronically inflamed from repeated trauma, repeated injury. Uh, You'd say, well, like, who injures their knee all the time? Who's injuring their elbow all the time? Especially people involved in sports, right? Does that make sense? So if you're involved in sports, if you're a basketball player, you're a soccer player, you're a professional tennis player, is it likely that you're going to injure your elbow if you're a tennis player? Is it likely that you're going to injure your knee if you're a soccer player? So they're really tough on their body. So they tend to develop osteoarthritis from repeated injury. And we, they have developed chronic uh, inflammation. And we had talked about previously that people with chronic inflammation may be given anti-inflammatory drugs, right? like uh, Motrin, ibuprofen. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease. It's actually more common in women. For some reason, autoimmune diseases are more, are more common in women. Uh, and uh, uh, this is where the immune system attacks the joints of the body. Uh, gouty arthritis, for short known as gout, is a metabolic disorder. It's a metabolic disorder. You'd say, what's metabolic mean? You tell me. What's metabolic mean? How about if we just say biochemical? Biochemical. It's a biochemical disorder. That's all that metabolic means. All right, so that's a metabolic. Each of these is a different problem, and they're treated in, with different medications. Uh, the, uh, now, what, what's going on in gout? The problem with gout, some of you remember this from an, my anatomy class, if you had me for anatomy, is hyperuricemia. What's that? High levels of uric acid in the blood. 
Why am I mentioning this right now? Because nucleic acids are turned into this waste product called uric acid. And this, these people have a biochemical disorder where they form high amounts of uric acid. Now this uric acid that they produce abnormally, this is not normal, but they produce high levels of uric acid, accumulates in their joints. And it irritates the joints. And it causes the joints to become inflamed in the inflammation because of this uric acid waste product accumulating in their joints. For some reason, we don't know why, it especially accumulates, this uric acid especially accumulates in the joints of the big toe. So the classic problem with gout or gouty arthritis is an enlarged, inflamed, large toe. It could be both toes, one toe, both toes, and so on. Yep. That's crystallized uric acid. That's the uric acid that's crystallizing and precipitating or accumulating in these joints, irritating the joints, causing them to become inflamed. Now, one of the things, and again, I talked all about, all about this in my anatomy class, for those of you who suffered me through, through with that. Uh, the, uh, one of the things you hear about with gout, I'm sure you've all heard this, is that if somebody has gout, they're supposed to not eat a lot of red meat. Remember that? Anybody? So why is that? So let's think about what red meat is. Red meat, meat is skeletal muscle. That's what meat is, is skeletal muscle. So now, you all had anatomy. All of you learned about skeletal muscle tissue. And skeletal muscle is unusual in the body because it's multinucleated. It, skeletal muscle cells don't just have one nucleus, they have multiple nuclei. All right, these are the striations, and these little purple dots represent multiple nuclei. All right, so that's what I wrote, multinucleated skeletal muscle. That's what meat is. So you'd say, okay, so what's the problem? So if you're eating meat, which is really, at the microscopic level, uh, uh, multinucleated muscle cells, you're ingesting high amounts of nucleic acid. You'd say, why? What are the main chemicals in a nucleus? DNA and RNA. That's why they're called nucleic acids. That's what's in a nucleus. So if these cells don't just have one nucleus, they've got lots of nuclei. So that means they are very high in nucleic acids. If somebody has gout, what are they turning their nucleic acids into at a fast rate? Uric acid. So, eating red meat, eating red meat, uh, which is high in nucleic acids, exacerbates this problem. So, eating red meat exacerbates gout. You'd say, what does exacerbate? That's an English word that means makes it worse. It makes it worse. Exacerbate. Let me give you another example of exacerbating. If somebody has diabetes, now in diabetes, uh, uh, what's, uh, what's their sugar level and their blood look like? It's very hot. So if you eat a lot of sugar, doesn't that exacerbate the problem? So in this case, we're not saying that eating sugar causes diabetes. We're not saying that eating meat causes your, uh, gout. They don't. These are genetic things. But they will make it worse. So what you eat can make things worse. All right, But it's not the original cause of the problem. 